America Looks Abroad. This is the 39th in a series of broadcasts presented by the staff members of the Foreign Policy Association. Today's subject is Italy's invasion of Africa. And the speaker is Mr. A. Randall Elliott, Research Associate of the Foreign Policy Association. Mr. Elliott. Good afternoon. As the long-awaited German attempt to invade England remained in its preparatory stages this week, Germany's three Axis partners, Italy, Spain, and Japan, continued their parallel policy to extend their territories at Great Britain's expense. While Britain must keep its greatest strength concentrated at home to stave off the anticipated German invasion, the extensive empire from which the British have long derived their power is threatened on three continents. In contrast with experience during the World War, when British imperial forces were able to sustain themselves and conquer German and Turkish colonies as well, today Britain's far-flung colonies face overwhelming enemy forces and can expect little or no help from the mother country. The most critical danger to the British Empire during the past week has been the Italian invasion of British colonies in Africa. Immediately after Italy's entry into the war two months ago, troops from Italian Somaliland and southern Ethiopia occupied the northeast corner of Britain's Kenya colony, while on July 5th, other Italian forces from Eritrea and northern Ethiopia attacked and took Kassala, eastern gateway for the rich cotton plantations of the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. Outside of these two minor offensives, however, Italy's war on Britain until last Sunday was limited to border skirmishes and guerrilla warfare. There was little indication of the extent to which Italy would, res would assume responsibility for carrying out Axis war plans. These plans were determined in Berlin last month when Italian Foreign Minister Ciano visited Chancellor Hitler. According to Virginio Gaida, semi-official spokesman of the fascist government, the two Axis leaders decided to enforce a rigid blockade of the British Isles, cut off all trade lines of the British Empire, and defeat Britain at home in its colonies and on the sea. Germany had already achieved marked success against British and French forces, and it was clear that if Italy was to profit from its tie-up with the Reich, the Italian army must also bear its share of the battle. The Italian navy could be of great military value to the Axis, provided it could gain access to the open sea. But so long as Britain retains control over the two entrances to the Mediterranean, at Gibraltar and Suez, Italy's fleet must remain bottled up in home waters. The immediate task before Italy, therefore, as Signor Gaida explained, was to weaken Britain by striking first at Egypt from the Italian colony of Libya, and then at the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, Kenya, and British Somaliland from Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Italian Somaliland in Italian East Africa. When Italy declared war on Britain on June 10th, Premier Mussolini named Egypt as one of the five small countries which he would not drag into war as long as it maintained strict neutrality. Egypt was a virtual British protectorate from 1881 until after the World War, and in 1922, when the country became independent, Britain retained responsibility for Egyptian defense. The enforcement of rigid neutrality by the Egyptian government would have been detrimental to Britain for the British can control the eastern Mediterranean only through continued use of the Suez Canal and their strong naval base at Alexandria, both of which are on Egyptian territory. Although the Egyptian government has actually remained neutral, it has favored its British ally by breaking off diplomatic relations with the Italian government and warning that it would declare war on Italy if the Italians invaded Egypt. To date, Italy's warfare in North Africa has been confined to aerial dogfights with British planes and to border skirmishes on the Libyan side of the Egyptian frontier. But the concentration of approximately 250,000 Italian troops along this front indicates that the major Italian offensive will be aimed at Alexandria and the Suez Canal by land through Egypt. One reason for the intensification of Italy's war effort in Africa, in fact, may be to relieve the pinch of the British blockade by gaining access to world trade routes through Suez and the Red Sea. Over 70% of Italy's normal imports are from overseas countries, and it is uncertain how much longer the Italians can do without these supplies. The Italians import 99% of their cotton, which is Egypt's staple crop. Their intense interest in Egypt is reflected in the large Italian colony there, and the Egyptian government has already taken precautionary measures to guard against fifth column activities by this group. In order to use the Suez Canal, 
if it should be conquered, Italy must also gain control over the southern gateway to the Red Sea. To achieve this objective, the second major field of Italian operations was destined to be British Somaliland. And last Sunday, Italian forces began their present African campaigns with an assault in this sector. The surrender early last week of French Somaliland, which had continued to resist Italian domination even after France itself had capitulated, made feasible a successful offensive into British Somaliland along the East African coast. The alternative route from Italian Somaliland crosses a rugged mountain range approximately 3,500 feet high, which the Italians would have had to penetrate slowly in the face of armed opposition. Along the coast, however, their greater numbers were rapidly decisive. On Monday, one day after the big offensive began, they entered Zyla, which is 15 miles inside British territory and guards entrance to the Red Sea. Today, three Italian columns are closing in on the capital city of Berbera, a leading British port of entry for troops and supplies from India. Italy's third big offen offensive in Africa is directed northward from Eritrea and Ethiopia against the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan in an effort to unite Italian forces in East Africa with those in Libya. Unless this drive seed succeeds, the East African forces, no matter how effective they may be against the British in Somaliland, will remain isolated and subject to counterattack when they use up their present supplies of munitions. Although it would be to Britain's obvious advantage to retain a foothold in Somaliland to serve as an entering wedge into East Africa for an eventual counterattack on the Italians, the British apparently intend to avoid the costly struggle this plan would entail. They seem determined to beat a strategic retreat in the barren border regions and fight to keep the Italians there, cut off from all communication with their home bases except by air. Meanwhile, the British harass their Italian foes in sporadic engagements and have recognized as an ally ex-Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, who is expected to rouse the Abyssinian Bushmen for an intensive guerrilla warfare against their Italian conquerors. South African troops with their own mechanized infantry, artillery, air force, medical corps, and engineer have also advanced into Kenya and engaged the Italians from the south. For all these areas of hostilities, Italy has massed an army totaling about 500,000 well-equipped white and native soldiers. Despite their extensive preparations, however, the Italians face serious obstacles to final success. The great distances to be overcome in Africa sorely tax both men and machines, and while much of the country is unknown or impassable, in the arid deserts of Libya and Egypt and in the northern Sudan, temperatures also rise to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and rifle barrels cannot be touched in midday while water is exceedingly scarce. The Italian army in this sector, like the British, has ample water supplies near its own bases, but will have to overcome precarious shortages as it moves out into the open. Britain, moreover, has strongly fortified the oases it holds, and these points can be defended by relatively few men against invading forces who must advance across vast open stretches of desert where they can be seen for many miles. In contrast with this kind of country, Seasonal rains along the upper Nile have converted the Ethiopian-Sudan border into marshland, which in many places is a total barrier to military operations. And finally, in addition to natural obstacles, the Italians must face British troops which have been very well trained for desert and jungle warfare. It remains to be seen whether the British in Africa, like the Finns early this year, will be defeated by sheer force of numbers. While the Italian drive towards Suez gets underway, another Axis partner, Spain, threatens the important British base at Gibraltar, which commands entrance to the Mediterranean from the west. Although the British have held Gibraltar ever since 1704, Spanish nationalists still regard the strategic rock as part of Spain. Generalissimo Franco has publicly announced that Spain intends to retake Gibraltar and extend Spanish territory in Africa. For over three months, Spanish students have put on periodical demonstrations demanding that Gibraltar be returned to Spain. Only two days ago, a leading Spanish newspaper printed a detailed map of Gibraltar with its fortifications and pointedly indicated the Spanish heavy gun emplacements at Algeciras and Ceuta, only five and twelve miles from the rock. A caption for the map typically referred to Gibraltar as Spain's ancient possession. 
When Italy entered the war, Spain gave up its neutrality for non-belligerency favorable to its Axis friends. And on Wednesday of this week, the government-controlled Spanish press announced that Spain has now adopted a position of moral belligerency, thus reinterpreting its legal status as one of positive support for Germany and Italy. The Reich now holds a common border with Spain, and if Spain enters the war, German troops could send immediate assistance to the Spanish. Although the impregnable fortress at Gibraltar could repel direct attack, it could not get needed supplies or reinforcement from the outside if enemies held the coasts of Spain, and eventually it would have to submit to siege. The Spanish, still exhausted from their recent civil war, have hoped to avoid involvement in the present conflict, but they seem to be drawn ever closer to war by their desire for colonial spoils. The promise of colonial rewards by Germany and Italy which they already regard as victorious powers, might readily attract them into hostilities. Rome and Berlin, in turn, would doubtless be willing to pay a high price for control over Gibraltar, which would enable the Italian fleet to enter the Atlantic and provide Germany with some of the sea power needed to invade the British Isles. Hard-pressed in Africa and Europe, the British Empire is also challenged in the Far East. When France surrendered in June and Britain was left to face the Axis alone, the Japanese war minister announced that the international situation was developing favorably for Japan's national policy. We should not miss the present opportunity, he told the Army General Staff, or we will be blamed by posterity. During the past half century of its imperial expansion, Japan has shown an almost psychic ability to select the exact moment when its power politics could best succeed. And this is the moment it has chosen to press Britain. Last month, Japan demanded that Britain prevent military supplies from being sent to China both by way of Hong Kong and over the Burma Road. And the British government submitted. On Thursday of this week, the ominous trend of Japanese foreign policy was further seen when 126 members of the Japanese House of Representatives presented the government with a resolution advocating strong measures to entirely wipe out British influence in East Asia. And on Friday, Britain announced the withdrawal of its troops from Shanghai and North China. These forces, like the United States Marines at Shanghai, Tianjin and Peiping, have defended foreign interests in China ever since the Boxer Rebellion ended in 1901. Their withdrawal at this time will presumably place a heavier burden on American troops. Britain's strength in the Far East is now concentrated at the island of Hong Kong, in the mouth of the Canton River, and at Singapore, where the British will take their last stand against Japan. It is uncertain, however, how long and how determined this stand will be. On Friday, the Right Wing East Asia Association in Tokyo formally urged the Japanese government to immediately declare war on Great Britain. Britain's appeasement of Japan, as of Germany and Italy during the past few years, seems only to have whetted the appetite of its antagonist. But the British government has little choice in what policy it will follow today. Britain is already involved in two wars when one was bad enough, and hopes to avoid all risk of military involvement in the Orient. Meanwhile, on three vital fronts, fascist powers are collaborating to undermine the British Empire. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to Mr. A. Randall Elliott, Research Associate of the Foreign Policy Association. If you would like a free copy of this talk, send your request to the Foreign Policy Association at number 8 West 40th Street, New York City. That address again, the Foreign Policy Association, number 8 West 40th Street, New York City, for a free copy of Mr. Elliott's talk. The Foreign Policy Association is a nonpartisan organization open to all who are interested in American foreign policy. It offers accurate information on current world events. And in the world of today, foreign affairs are your affairs. We invite you to tune in next Sunday to hear another speaker in the series, America Looks Abroad. This is the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York. Thank you.